Welcome. My name is Mike Letson. I'm a diplomat at the United States Embassy here in Israel, where I cover issues of human rights and religious freedom. I'm honored to be hosting a live discussion today with you, our online audience. To mark International Religious Freedom Day, we're here at the American Center in Jerusalem to discuss the topic of religious freedom. Before introducing our guest expert, let me start by telling you a little bit about this state-of-the-art American Center. This is a public space for programming and outreach by the United States Embassy. It attracts young professionals, entrepreneurs, high school and college students, teachers, NGOs, cultural institutions, and civil society groups. The American Center designs and implements programs to advance a shared and inclusive society through English language classes, advising on studying in the United States, reducing gaps in education and technological capacity, teacher training, and activities for secondary schools. The American Center brings together diverse sectors of Jerusalem's population who do not regularly have the opportunity or the location to interact. We welcome you to stop by if you're in Jerusalem. And I think it's especially fitting that we're holding this discussion about religious freedom in Jerusalem, a city that billions of people worldwide view as holy. I'd like to first explain why the United States works to advance religious freedom worldwide. Since the earliest days of our nation, America has stood for religious freedom. Settlers left their homes to set sail for a new world where they could practice their faith without fear of persecution. They wrote protections for religion into their founding charters and early laws. And after America gained independence, the founders of our country enshrined religious freedom as the first freedom in the Constitution of the United States. As our first president, George Washington, wrote in his famous letter to the Hebrew congregation in Newport, we give to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance. Promoting religious freedom worldwide is our foreign policy because it is not exclusively an American right. It is a universal right for all mankind. Seventy years ago, Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights affirmed this fact by declaring that everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes freedom to change his religion or belief, and freedom either alone or in community with others, and in public or private, to manifest his religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship, and observance. Nonetheless, millions of people of all faiths are suffering every day. Three quarters of the world's population live in countries where they had some or substantial religious persecution taking place. Violations of religious freedom can take the form of, for example, state-sponsored state slander campaigns, confiscations of property, surveillance by security police, including by special divisions of religious police, severe prohibitions against construction and repair of places of worship, denial of the right to assemble, relegation of religious communities to illegal status through arbitrary registration laws, prohibitions against the pursuit of education or public office, prohibitions against religious rituals, and prohibitions against publishing, distributing, or possessing religious literature or materials. More severe and violent forms of religious persecution include detention, torture, beatings, forced marriage, rape, imprisonment, enslavement, mass resettlement, and death. In some countries, religious believers are forced to meet secretly, and religious leaders are targeted by national security forces and hostile mobs. We can see a modern example in the brutality that ISIS perpetrated against the Yazidis and other religious minorities. Even in countries that enshrine religious freedom into law, such as in Europe, attacks on Jews are growing at an alarming rate. And of course, the horrific attack in Pittsburgh just a few days ago, the deadliest attack on a Jewish community in the history of the United States, shows that a murderous ideology and hatred has reared its ugly head in our country as well. Jews around the world feel threatened by the scourge of anti-Semitism. There is only one solution to this, 
We must call out and root out anti-Semitism wherever it exists. We must call out and root out all forms of hatred wherever they exist. When religious liberty is denied or destroyed, we know that other freedoms, the freedom of speech, press, assembly, and even democratic institutions themselves are at risk. Rejecting religious freedom breeds radicalism and resentment. It sows the seeds of violence within a country's borders, which often spills across borders to neighboring countries. And as history has shown too many times, those who deny religious freedom for their own people have no qualms trampling upon the rights of other people, undermining security and peace across the wider world. On the other hand, defending and advancing religious freedom means not only protecting the right to practice one's faith, it lays the foundation for opportunity, prosperity, security, and peace. It is an essential building block for all free societies. On October 27, 1998, our Congress passed the International Religious Freedom Act to promote this basic liberty worldwide. This is why the United States marks October 27 as International Religious Freedom Day every year. One of the requirements of this law was that the United States, through the State Department, must submit to Congress every year a detailed report on the status of religious freedom in each country. We call this the International Religious Freedom Report. Our 2017 report was released on May 29th of this year. To mark 20 years since the passage of this law, I'm joined here at the American Center in Jerusalem by Michael Broy, professor of law at Emory University School of Law and the projects director of the Center for the Study of Law and Religion at Emory. He is currently in Israel as a Fulbright Senior Scholar at Hebrew University. His most recent book is Sharia Tribunals, Rabbinical Courts, and Christian Panels, Religious Arbitration in America and the West. I'll kick off the conversation with a couple of questions for you, Professor Broyd, and then I'll ask you to address some questions that we received from our online audience. First, let's talk about a topic that is a big part of the national discourse here in Israel, which is the intersection of religion and state. In the United States, of course, we make a fairly strict separation of religion and state, but most countries do not have such a strict separation. So what does an official state religion mean for religious freedom? This is a very, very important question. There are really, in the United States, two distinctly different freedoms. The first is that the government of the United States doesn't establish a church or a religion as the official religion of the United States. Lawyers call that disestablishment. It means there's no official church of the United States, and when the government aids religion, it aids all religions equally, and perhaps even it can't aid religion more than it aids any other similar activity. But a second type of freedom is the freedom of personal religious observance. Um, that kind of freedom, what we call in the United States the free exercise of religion, is actually a very different kind of protection. That guarantees me the right to worship as I see fit. To most Americans, they can't imagine a society in which there is both um, an established church and a lack of religious freedom. But actually, if you stop and think about it, there are many Western societies that have established churches, but which guarantee personal religious freedom. Um, I am of the view that while the American system cannot exist with an established church, religious freedom certainly can exist and thrive in a country in which there is an established church. Our mother country, to the extent we think us Americans still have a mother country, is England. And England is a classic example of a country that has an established church, the Anglican Church, the Church of England, that is closely connected to government um, and indeed is the official church of England. And thus, from an American perspective, we would call that unconstitutional. But religious freedom is robustly guaranteed in English society because it has very strong doctrines of personal religious freedom. 
And so it's important as America projects itself to the rest of the world in the area of religious freedom that we Americans recognize that there's one aspect of religious freedom called disestablishment, which is not uniquely American, but deeply rooted in America. And the second is um, a religious expression of every kind, which is very much found in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and is also in the United States Constitution. Countries that have an established church, like Israel, like England, like many other countries, nonetheless can excel at providing personal religious freedom to members of their community, even who do not belong to the established church, or who, like in Israel, belong to the established faith, but worship in a different way. The idea that religious freedom is inexorably connected to disestablishment is a well-rooted American idea, but it's not the only um, way to go about doing it. I indeed, we can point to countries, France being the classical example, where there's deep disestablishment, but yet religious freedom is diminished in the name of disestablishment because the government says you can't dress in a certain way in public because all religious symbolism in public um, shall not be allowed in order to prevent um, any religious flavor in the public square. The American model is a balance. We allow robust religious expression while preventing the government from favoring one religion over another. Um, but you can have vibrant religious freedom, vibrant, vibrant, wonderful religious freedom, even in a country that has um, a national church. Iceland is another wonderful example of this. There's an official church of Iceland. It's supported by the government, but yet religious freedom is everywhere, and the government of Iceland takes no steps to make sure that every good Icelander belongs to the Church of Iceland, and it doesn't prevent anybody in Iceland from worshiping as they see fit. Um, so the people in America look at this and say, really? But we can't really imagine that. Um, we think that religious freedom is both of these pillars. But I think it's important as we talk about religious freedom out there that we separate what John Witte calls the unique American experiment which is both disestablishment and personal religious freedom. And we focus instead just on personal religious freedom as a basic requirement for um, uh, an open and free democratic society. It's that which I think Congress had in mind when it wanted a religious freedom report. And it's that which the Universal Declaration of Human Rights encapsulates in Article 18, and it's that aspect of the British experiment that's so intriguing worldwide and so fascinating to us Americans. Wow, terrific. So that's, because really you're making a strong distinction there between the degree of establishment between the state and the religion on one level and the degree of personal liberty uh, and personal religious freedom for individuals and on another dimension, another, another level of the conversation. Yes, again, uh, it's worth thinking about England. The, uh, the monarch is the head of the church, and um, there's intense entanglement between church and state, so much so that the head of the state has to be the titular head of the church. We have a hard time imagining that in the United States. We have a hard time saying that the president of the United States shall be the head of the Church of the United States. That's so foreign that it doesn't even pass the giggle test um, in our country. But still, when you say to the government of England, I don't want to be part of the Anglican Church. I wish to have a Jewish community, or a Muslim community, or a Baha'i community, or, uh, or a Catholic community, the government says, of course, you're welcome to do so. These two ideas are intensely entangled in the American First Amendment. They are intensely 
entangled, almost inexorably so. But they need not be, and religious freedom can exist, even in countries with robust established churches. Hmm. Very important point. Yeah, absolutely. To, to many nations, the idea that we will disestablish our church is so culturally jarring as to make it a constitutional revolution. Um, almost impossible to imagine. And to set the bar of religious freedom at the American twin model of disestablishment plus personal freedom causes people to say that can never happen here. A better model for us is to say to countries, even if you have an established church, and robust democracies can have established churches, you need to work diligently at making sure there's space in your national church for individuals to worship as they see fit. Now let's stick with the American example just for one more moment, because one thing that I hear a lot from my counterparts here in Israel, they ask about the United States example, and they say, well, you're not really uh, separating church and state when you have in God we trust on your currency, and you pledge allegiance to the flag, one nation under God, in your public middle schools and elementary schools and high schools. So can you talk a little bit, a little bit about uh, the, this establishment and those examples of... Uh, sure, we have a tradition in the United States of what we call ceremonial deism. We occasionally invoke the deity in things like, in God we trust or one nation under God. We have a long tradition of this ceremonialism. When you come to court, you have the option of swearing on a Bible that you're telling the truth. But these are essentially only ceremonial activities. They don't have any deep substance to them. And when they are mandatory, we always give you a secular option. So even the Constitution, when the president takes his oath of office, the president has the ability to affirm instead of swear, because even the founding fathers recognized that there were religious groups that didn't wish to swear, but only wished to affirm. I guess, of course, somebody who says, well, I'm offended by the notion in God and we trust, so I can't use American money. The correct response is sort of get over it, in the sense that ceremonial deism impacts on nobody's substantive rights in any important way. Um, and there are sorts of some controversy in the United States, but ultimately ceremonial deism is um, the least offensive form of establishment because um, it doesn't require anything of anybody at all. It's purely the government talking. We would be extremely offended if we said, for example, you could not be a government official unless you started every, you started your term of office by saying, in God we trust. Um, that would strike us as a religious test for office and would be completely unconstitutional. We do not require um, government officials to affirm any religious beliefs or even the belief in a ceremonial deity, even though sometimes um, the government itself will occasionally invoke um, nominal deities, like in God we trust, or one nation under God. That level of intertwining is markedly less than even England's or Iceland's, never mind um, countries that have substantive religious establishment. So once again, bringing us back to that point which you made earlier of separating out the difference between personal religious liberty and establishment by the state. Yes, and by the way, personal here doesn't only mean one person. It means my right to form a community of people who worship as our community wants. In England, it's not just that I can worship as I see fit, it's that me and my 5,000 best friends can form uh, an evangelical Protestant church and form a mega, the mega church of London. And the government says, that's wonderful. That's wonderful as well. It's not just about one person's freedom because religion is a communitarian activity. And when I have a religious freedom right, 
I need to have the right to bring together like-minded people so that we can worship as a community. Mm -hmm. The model in which we give you personal freedom but we don't allow you to form a group would be an anathema to personal freedom because religious worship is not just a personal activity, it's a group activity. Countries that guarantee personal religious freedom guarantee group rights of religious freedom as well. Right. That's a very important distinction there. Now you've you've presented this model, this uh, distinction, uh, many different places around the world. Can you talk a little bit about what kind of impact your approach has had outside of Israel? Sure. The hope in presenting this model is that it inspires countries that have been lax in individual rights of religious freedom to recognize that they can expand the space available for personal and communal worship without having to give up on an established church. This creates a model that allows the dramatic increase in religious liberty without forcing the disestablishment. Um, many nations have established churches, and many nations who have established churches also do not have enough religious liberty. Um, the question is, how do you move then from the model of suppressing the religious, personal or individual or group religious liberty? And I've always thought that the correct approach is to acknowledge that they have the right to have an established church and they have to work on expanding the space available for individual liberty even as they have an established church. Many countries around the Middle East have established churches. Indeed, I think every single country around the Middle East has an established church. But individual liberty varies enormously in these, in the, in these countries. We need to press countries that have established churches to allow for greater individual liberty. Sometimes we press them politically, but I find for myself just laying out that the idea that individual liberty is not at all inconsistent with an established governmental church um, opens people's eyes to various models. They look at the American experience, which is very diverse cultures, no dominant religion. Um, there is no single um, religious community that represents more than 20% of the United States. And they say, that's just not a successful model for my country where 97% of the people belong to the same denomination. So of course the government is going to favor the denomination that most people belong to. To which I say, well, of course, that becomes an established church when you're Iceland and 86% of your society belongs to the Church of Iceland, it becomes the established church. That's almost normal. But just because such a large percentage of people belong to the established church, doesn't mean you have to suppress the groups that don't belong. That's why this is such an important message for the many countries that are weak in personal freedom. If the first step to becoming um, to granting religious freedom is disestablishing my church. That's a, a bridge too far for most countries. It's a bridge too far for England. Never mind a bridge too far for Saudi Arabia. Um, but the idea that there'll be places and times where even in a country with one dominant religion, alternative religious faiths can be established that's perfectly reasonable and easy to establish. It creates protected space of diverse religious worship. It's a model that's worthy of sharing in almost every country that has some sort of an established church. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, a specific point. I just want to emphasize for our audience when we say church, we're referring to this in, colloquially as we do in the United States. Of course. I mean, this is so important. Uh, uh, in the United States, even people like me who belong to a synagogue, nonetheless, will sometimes refer to their synagogue in legal terms as a church because 
the church here is a reference to a, a religious institution or organization. So, um, of course, the word church here doesn't mean church. The word church here means mosque. The word church here means synagogue. The word church here means evangelical temple that might not even identify as the word church. It means a Baha'i community that might not even have a formal religious structure. It means this idea of a religious community. I'm sufficiently American, for better or for worse, um, that I still use the term separation of church and state, even though I recognize that even that term has Christian biases to it. Right. Yes, of course, 100%. So, you know, we talked a little bit about, uh, you were getting onto the topic of having a, a difference between the establishment and the religious freedom, personal religious freedom. Um, you know, one thing that we hear about a lot here in Israel from my uh, contacts and counterparts uh, is a concern about uh, the relationship between religious freedom, religious discrimination, and equality or inequality, things like, for example, subsidies from the government to one religious group or another. Can you talk a little bit about that in the American context and in Israel and other places? Sure. We'll start with the American context. In the United States, when government aids religion, it has to aid all religions almost uniformly without any um, religious bias. Of course, it can look at need. It need not earthquake proof um, churches in a place where there are no earthquakes uh, but that's not religious discrimination that's need-based discrimination the government in the United States um, cannot does not and should not provide financial aid based on um, any sense that this church is more religiously worthy of financial aid than that church the government sometimes provides assistance to um, religious institutions that are in poorer neighborhoods at greater levels than it provides for religious institutions in wealthier neighborhoods, and sometimes that even correlates to denomination. Sometimes it even correlates to denomination, but the government would never be allowed to look at a specific religious faith and say this faith is more worthy of subsidy. Governments that have official religions of course, engage in activities that subsidize in one way or another their religious communities. The question is how much of the subsidy and how reasonable is it to function without the subsidy? Um, in Israel, the government of Israel subsidizes um, religion generally. So the government, for example, pays for rabbinical court judges, but that's not really a subsidy of religion because it pays for qadis in the Islamic community as well. It pays for religious court systems at the government expenses. But the government in Israel provides for a wealth of religious subsidies on a variety of other levels as well. It provides subsidies for um, some Jewish school systems. It provides some clergy subsidies, it provides some land subsidies. The government here is not neutral in its application of financial assistance. It favors um, those branches of Judaism that the chief rabbi it believes are consistent with the mission of Israel to have an established church. Um, the more heavily the subsidy is, and the less able communities that don't receive the subsidy are to function, the less religious freedom a country has. Um, there's a difference between providing small subsidies at the margins and providing such massive subsidies so that, in fact, all other options are curtailed. And there's also a difference between providing subsidies because most people go there and providing subsidies because you believe this is true. So the school systems in Israel um, could be redone so that um, government provides the same amount per student to schools of a variety of different denominations. Still, the Orthodox would get the overwhelming majority of the subsidies, but that's not because um, they're more worthy in the government's eyes. It's just because the government's allowed to subsidize 
uh, based on the number of students who are attending an institution with 100 students reasonably gets 10 times more than an institution with 10 students. Subsidies are complicated because um, governments with established churches provide assistance to the churches. They do. When you go to England, Anglican churches are frequently supported by more government assistance than synagogues or mosques. But anybody who's been to England sees that there's vibrant and thriving non-subsidized um, religion. It would be bad for Israel if um, the government involvement in religious freedom through its financial ability to subsidize substantially curtailed the ability of other denominations within Judaism or other religions other than Judaism to function because the subsidies are not available. This issue, by the way, is sometimes present in the United States, even with private religious schools. The Supreme Court has protected the ability of um, like-minded individuals to form a private religious school more than 100 years ago in a famous Supreme Court case. But it might become economically unviable to run a private religious school system as the economics get tighter and tighter and your right to religious freedom substantially disappears if it's a private pay right and the costs of private pay are too high for normal people to actually afford. Um, there's no exact way of knowing this, but when we look at Israeli society, we do not see a society in which the overwhelming majority of people are observant. Religious freedom in the sense of personal practice is readily observant day in and day out in Israel. All you need to do is see that um, most of society here is not um, what we would call orthodox in any way, shape, or form. And you see from this that the, the amount of pressure provided on people to comply with Jewish law is uh, smaller other than in the area of family law, which we will certainly discuss. Mm -hmm. There's one other important thing. Sometimes the government makes rules of accommodation. And rules of accommodation have an aspect of coercion because they diminish my choices. So in Israel, it's very common to find only kosher food is available at public events. Um, and at some level, this appears to be coercive because some people don't want kosher food. But I think that it's, that's not quite the same. Um, the government's ability to mandate a common standard on trivial matters builds community. Um, while I have the right to buy any food I wish, kosher or not kosher, even in Jerusalem, um, once a certain percentage of the people keep kosher, it makes reasonable sense that the government says um, kosher food shall be provided at government functions for everybody so as to make the large number of people feel comfortable. To give an American example, Christmas is a federal holiday. All federal employees are off on Christmas. And when a federal employee says, well, I don't celebrate Christmas. I wish to work on Christmas. The government says, I'm so sorry, the office is closed because the overwhelming majority of people wish to be off for Christmas. So it's efficient for us to close the offices on Christmas rather than to allow 10% of our employees to work. Um, this has aspects of establishment, but these aspects of establishment are grounded in um, the sense that when almost everybody, or when even a significant percentage of people want something, it's just more efficient to give it to everybody um, than it is to um, allow everybody to do as they see fit. So some aspects of religious accommodation in Israel come from the fact that 20% of society observes Jewish law. So when 20% of society observes Jewish law, 
the day schools, the, the public schools close early on Friday. And schools are closed on Jewish holidays, even though the people who don't observe the Jewish holidays might like school. But that at some level is no different than public schools being off on Christmas, even in a, in a place where a third of the students might not celebrate Christmas. So not every aspect of Israeli society is driven by this, and marriage is the big exception, but many are driven by the majority's desire to accommodate the minority. And you made an interesting point, I thought, earlier when you said uh, that you give the example of a, of a public function, uh, and you said that all the food would have to be kosher in Israel, for example. When we're talking about a public function, what about a function that is uh, open to the public, but it is conducted by private parties? So in Israel, um, I think the rule is that all government functions are kosher, government functions. Um, but private functions need not be kosher, and um, if you don't like the food, go to the event and don't eat, or don't go to the event. But it makes sense that when I deal with a public function where people are expected to participate, it's a duty of citizenship to participate, um, that we would accommodate any substantial minority in their desire. My favorite teaching example, of course, is one that's very New York. Uh, many people don't know this, but New York has alternate side of the street parking, in which every other day you have to park on a different side of the street. So the street cleaners can clean the streets. But alternate side of the street parking is sometimes suspended um, in the face of a religious holiday. This is not the government establishment of religious holidays. This is the government accommodation of religious practices of people in New York. So. Um, there's no alternate side of the street parking on important Islamic holidays, on important Jewish holidays, on important Christian holidays, and on many other holidays where a significant percentage of the people don't wish to move their car from one side of the street to the other. It's not that New York City has 12 different established religions. It's that it wishes to accommodate the reasonable needs of the community of people that it serves. Um, I don't think accommodation in any way, shape, or form resembles establishment. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very important point. Um, you mentioned earlier about family law. Well, let's turn to that. We have a we got a question in advance from our online audience. This is from Mindy Goldberg, who asked, uh, in Israel, there are thousands of Israeli couples who have the status of Yudhim Betzibor, which is the equivalent of a common law marriage. Would it be possible for the United States to recognize these couples as married if they seek a visa to the United States. So I'll answer the visa question first, and then I'll ask you to discuss marriage and divorce. Um, so for the purposes of US immigration law, in order for a cohabitation to be considered a valid marriage, it must satisfy two requirements. The first is that it must bestow all the legal rights and duties that are bestowed in a lawfully contracted marriage. And the second is that it must be recognized by local laws as fully equivalent in every respect to a traditional legal marriage. Now, to satisfy that second requirement, local laws must provide no means of terminating the relationship other than a divorce, a potential right to alimony, a right of custody of children, and a right to intestate distribution of an estate, provided that those rights are held by traditionally married couples. Now, marriages in Israel cannot be unilaterally dissolved, whereas a cohabitation relationship may be dissolved at any time by the parties. So generally speaking, Common law marriages are not formalized or documented. So while a domestic partnership is considered legal for other purposes, including inheritance rights, for example, civil service pension law and the national insurance law, the Israeli Ministry of the Interior does not recognize common law marriage relationships as the equivalent of traditional marriage in two respects. One, it will not change the listed marital status of an applicant based on cohabitation or a common law relationship. And two, it does not accept a common law marriage as sufficient to allow the immigration of a common law status. Uh, so Professor Boyd, earlier you mentioned Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but Mindy's question and what you referred to earlier about family law brings us to Article 16 of that same declaration, 
which says men and women of full age without any limitation due to race, nationality, or religion have the right to marry and to found a family. So can you explain the complications that arise between religion and the universal human right to marry? Sure. The, the central problem here in Israel is, is that um, Israel has more robust established religion and family law than it does in any other area. Essentially, Israel inherited from or the British of the millet system of family law. In the millet system of family law, which the British left in India, Pakistan, Israel, um, Sri Lanka, Egypt, I think Libya, but I'm not sure if it's still the law in Libya, and many other countries. When the British came here, the British said, we don't want to meddle in local family law matters, so everybody shall continue to marry according to their religious community. So India and Israel both kept the British model in which um, you married according to your faith, and the government delegated to your faith um, who could marry and under what circumstances. So in Israel right now, Israel has a variety of denominations, but everybody can get married only in their denomination. So if you are Jewish, you can only get married according to um, Jewish law by the rabbinate. If you're Muslim, you can only get married by Islamic law. If you're Catholic, you can only get married according to Catholic law. Um, Israel more robustly establishes um, family law by religious standards than almost any other Western country, although India and Israel are identical with the exception of the fact that India is a hundred times larger um, than Israel. Israel tempers the rigor of this law by its Yadua B'tzibur, by its common law marriage model, which allows people to establish almost marital relationships by dint of just living together in public um, as, if they, as if they are married. Um, Yadua B'tzibur, common law marriages, well-known relationships, however, as you said so eloquently, can end through either party walking out of the marriage they have, so to speak, what we would call in America a common law divorce, which does not exist in any common law country, actually. There is no such thing as a common law divorce. So uh, Yadua B'tzivur relationships, common public relationships in Israel, are easy to enter into and easy to end. And I'll tell you even a little bit of a more complicated secret. You can be married to one person and be in a common law relationship with somebody else. So a man can be married to a woman in Israel, and according to the chief rabbinate, a fully legal marriage, and be in a Yadua B'tzibur, a well-known public relationship with another man. And both of those relationships will be recognized as valid by the Israeli government. And on top of that, Israel has an easy release valve of Israel recognizes all validly contracted marriages performed outside of Israel. Um, so I think I read somewhere that more than 20% of the couples who get married fly to Cyprus to get married, which is not quite a hop, skip, and a jump, but a very short plane ride from here in order to defeat um, the monopolistic jurisdiction of the chief rabbi. The central wiggle room in Article 16 is in its third paragraph. The third paragraph of Article 16 says the state shall have the authority, I don't remember the exact language, to protect the sanctity of marriage. So even though parties shall have the ability to marry as they see fit, um, the state has some regulatory power um, over the marriage model. And um, Article 16 has thus been widely understood so as to, prefer, for example, to prevent a person from marrying more than two people at one time. Um, um, or, or to get divorced without going through the proper divorce process. The central religious freedom question in Israel, however, has to do with whether Israel ought to introduce a path of civil marriage. Um, the dilemma in Israel is two different dilemmas. 
And it's actually, they're very different. One dilemma is there are a large number of um, new Israeli residents from the former Soviet Union who identify as Jewish, but who are not recognized as sufficiently Jewish by the rabbinate, which will not marry them. That's a, a very scandalously bad situation because there are hundreds of thousands of people here who identify as Jewish, but who have no lawful way to get married. They cannot marry as Christians because they are not Christian. They cannot marry as Jews because the rabbinate will not recognize them as sufficiently Jewish. Um, that's a scandalously bad situation. Um, everybody from the rabbinate onward recognizes that a solution is needed to this um, situation, and a solution is needed. There's a violation here of Article 16 to have anybody in your country who cannot lawfully marry anybody, who cannot lawfully marry anybody. They cannot marry Jewish. They cannot marry Christian. Israel, of course, has no civil marriage. Even um, former chief rabbis have said that they favor a civil marriage track for people in that situation. There are other proposals out there to solve that problem as well, because this community essentially wishes to be part of the Jewish community. And there are proposals relating to conversion, conversion of adults, conversion of children, like the Giyor Kahalacha proposal that Rabbi Nachum Rovinovich is supporting, and many, many, many others. These are all proposals that are designed to widen the gates of access to Jewish marriage. The other problem is the intermarriage problem, uh, which is a much smaller problem in Israel than the Russian problem. It's a small percentage of society. Um, it does represent an application of family law that us Americans would bristle at because it represents the establishment of not just one church, but many churches, meaning you have to get married within your church. There's no uh, civil marriage. In a country that has an established church, this might be an area where um, less governmental regulation would be appropriate, but societies are allowed to try to preserve um, their cultural ethnographic model. Many countries do things to preserve their cultural norms that we Americans bristle at. Many European countries have lists of authorized names, and you can only give your child an authorized name. And when you say, but I don't like any of the authorized names, I want to name my child Chetziba Tomato, the government says you can't because that's not an authorized name. We Americans look at that and say, what? The government insists that I have a name on a list? Um, but societies do things to preserve their culture um, that are un-American, but aren't always terrible infringements on basic liberty. Maybe barriers against intermarriage are necessary to preserve the established church. We'll call it here a church, but really I know and you know it's a synagogue um, in Israel that aren't so offensive to the International Declaration of Human Rights, although we Americans would label them as totally, absolutely, and completely unconstitutional. Um, I'm not terribly bothered by it. I'm more bothered by the significant number of people who identify as Jewish, but who are not recognized as sufficiently Jewish by the chief rabbinate, even though they are recognized as Jewish by the government of Israel, that they have no legitimate marriage rights in the state of Israel. It's very troubling to say to somebody, there is no lawful marriage for you in this country. Um, I'll go even a little bit further and say it violates a basic human right to not allow a person to get married in any framework. It even, by the way, violates aspects of the Jewish tradition, which is what motivates various members of the chief rabbinate to propose solutions even intrinsic to the Jewish tradition. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing that we haven't been talking a lot about 
marriage, we haven't yet turned to divorce. Now, you mentioned that the, uh, I think it was a Supreme Court decision here that ruled that uh, an event that led to the policy that the Ministry of Interior will recognize any uh, marriage, legally lawful uh, marriage from overseas. What about divorce? Is it the same? Can a person get divorced overseas? The person can get divorced overseas. The government of Israel will recognize your validly entered divorce overseas. The Ministry of the Interior or the Ministry of Religion will not recognize the end of your rabbinically performed marriage with the end of your civil marriage, but the government of Israel certainly will. The Jewish tradition in the United States and in Israel has confronted the problem of recalcitrant spouses, which is spouses who refuse to participate in the Jewish divorce ritual. Unlike the common law, where a judge grants you a divorce, neither party needs to participate. You can be divorced um, by judicial fiat, even in rare situations where neither one of you wants it, actually. But certainly, in a situation in which only one party appears in court, the judge can grant a divorce uh, by judicial order. In the Jewish tradition, a judge can only grant a divorce. A judge can never grant a divorce. A judge can order a husband to divorce his wife and a wife to receive a divorce from her husband. When the husband steadfastly refuses to participate in Israel, they will send you to jail under the hopeful theory that that will persuade you um, to change your mind. But ultimately, um, the Jewish tradition doesn't have a profound solution to the problem of a husband who steadfastly uh, will not grant his wife a Jewish divorce. The rabbinical courts here work at it. I would claim they could work harder at it, and they should be more diligent at protecting the rights of the wife to receive a divorce, and they should use harsher remedies more frequently against the husband. But this doesn't seem to be an intrinsic and deep structural problem. Um, it's also worth recognizing the flip side. The American model in which a judge can declare um, your marriage over um, itself has problems. The former president of the United States, Jimmy Carter, tells a wonderful story about his uncle Gordy. His uncle Gordy was a Marine in Guadalcanal who was captured by the Japanese in 1942. But everybody thought he was dead, um, except he wasn't. He was in a Japanese prisoner of war camp. He had a wife in the United States who um, was told that your husband is dead, you can remarry. She remarried. After World War II, her husband came back and said, here I am, I've been thinking about you all these years in very hard prisoner of war camps, um, what's new with you? To which she said, I've remarried um, because you're dead. To which he said, think again, guess what? And tragedy resulted from that, President Carter recounts, meaning systems of unilateral divorce, no different than systems of bilateral divorce, sometimes generate tragedy. Um, I'll say something even more hard. Systems of divorce are hard. No nation has perfected um, divorce. Almost everybody comes out of their divorce saying, I don't think I'm going to do it again. It's not like an ice cream cone where people say, this was wonderful, when's the next one? Um, nobody comes out of their divorce and says, this worked really well. I think I'll get married again and then get divorced. Divorce is hard hard in Israel. It doesn't work excellently in Israel. It doesn't work excellently in the United States either. The problem of recalcitrant spouses is more present in, in Israel, in the Israeli system, than it is in other systems. On the whole, the divorce system here probably shows the same level of customer satisfaction than it does in the United States, which is none too high. None too high. You know, one final question. When I speak to people about religious freedom, they often bring up interfaith dialogue. Now, I think there's some confusion about these two concepts. Can you talk a little bit about the connection or lack of connection between them? Sure. Look, interfaith dialogue is not a governmental activity, neither in the United States nor in Israel, and it's not about the rights parties have. There was a period of time in the United States 
and in Europe, led by Vatican II, which the Israelis were also somewhat part of, where the Catholic Church put forward a model of interfaith dialogue and ecumenicism in the hopes that um, if communities of religious leaders got together to discuss what would divide them, um, there maybe would be fewer divisions, and even more likely there would be less hatred. This, on the whole, sounds like a good idea. Less hatred sounds like a good idea. Um, religious freedom, though, tends to be about governmental models. Interfaith dialogue, ecumenicism, tends to be about um, how I view the other in my community as a private party or as a private church. It serves a valuable and important idea. We are unhappy when faith groups hate each other. And we all know that the visceral hatred that sometimes erupts between denominations sometimes turns into group violence. And even when it doesn't turn into group violence, it turns into horrible acts by individuals that kill other people. The terrible murder in Pittsburgh of just a few days ago um, is a horrible thing, and horrible, horrible thing. But it's not the only one. We know that last year there was a murder in a church in Texas in which 25 people were killed. And, and um, Interfaith ecumenicism, the idea that I'm going to discuss my faith with you, so I'm going to understand your faith better, so I'm going to look at you with less scorn, so I as a clerical leader will not stand up in my church or mosque and, or synagogue and say, um, it would be better if that community were dead, is extremely important. It's important in the United States. It's important in Israel, where there have been occasionally in the past religiously motivated killings. It's important in Europe, where anti-Semitism seems to be rising. A, a general message out there is a very important one. Um, when you see people express ideas of religious intolerance, the most important thing you can do as a person who is not religiously intolerant is to say, I don't agree with that and you shouldn't express these ideas. Even if you think that the person who's expressing them would never grab a rifle and kill somebody, and they're just expressing their bigotry and intolerance over their Thanksgiving dinner because that's the thing your family does over Thanksgiving, not my family. But other families, I hear, sometimes do this. We all bear a duty to express broad tolerance and ecumenicism and protest when people say things that are derogatory towards other religious groups, even when they're members of a religious community that you're glad you're not. It's important to understand that you can bear pride and faith in your religious community. You can wear it on your shoulder happily and identify as a card-carrying member of the Catholic Church without tolerating bigotry by those in your own community. And the rebuke is best delivered by people who are members of your own community. Jewish intolerance has to be dismissed by the rabbinic establishment. Catholic intolerance has to be dismissed by the Catholic community Islamic intolerance has to be dismissed by imams and qadis. It doesn't come from members of another community telling you you're in an intolerant faith. It comes from a groundswell of people in your own faith and in your own community objecting to religious intolerance. That builds a more tolerant, open society in which religious freedom is mandated by the government becomes possible on the street. The great fear in Europe is that even though religious freedom is the legal norm in Europe, the community in Europe has grown less and less tolerant of religious freedom in practice. And that it's harder and harder to be 
a deviant in reality because the people on the street are intolerant. Two years ago, I was with my daughter in Italy and we were looking for a house of worship, a Jewish house of worship, what we'll call here a Jewish church. And it's easy, in fact, to spot the Jewish churches in Italy because they're the places that have military vehicles in front of them and dozens of armed guards protecting them. The churches are unprotected. Um, the Zoroastrian places of worship from times of old are unprotected. But the, the Jewish churches are massively protected because um, the society is not as tolerant as it should be. Ecumenicism is a tool for teaching people that not only should the law be tolerant, not only should we teach and preach religious freedom as a legal right, but I on the street should seek to protect people's right to worship and live as they see fit. It's scandalous that people dress, people who are dressed as ministers sometimes find themselves fat in Jerusalem. It's intolerant. It's unacceptable. It's wrong. Um, it's unacceptable as well that people who walk around as rabbis in European cities find themselves spat at or worse. Um, this is the kind of tolerance that doesn't come from a law. This is the kind of tolerance that comes from practical ecumenicism, from interfaith dialogue, from people sharing that the other, who I don't agree with, and whose faith I don't wish to join, and I'm not worshiping in their church because I don't agree with the tenets of their faith. Nonetheless, they're a person and I should adopt a live and let live attitude towards my practical society. That's a very important real world situation. No society is perfect at that. And I used to have a dean at Emory Law School who said perfection is sometimes the enemy of the very good. I aspire to live in a society that's simply very good at practical pluralism, where in almost all situations, everything is tolerated on the street. And the kind of ad hoc violence that we sometimes see in places where Jews or Muslims or even Yazids or even Christians are attacked because of their religious beliefs has no place in a society that professes belief in uh, religious topics. Excellent. And on that note, we're out of time, so I want to conclude with a very, very big thank you to Professor Broyd uh, for enlightening us about religious freedom in the United States, Israel, and worldwide. This is really a critical topic that I think is becoming more and more important and relevant each day. To our online audience, thank you for joining us today. I invite you to visit uh, our American Center here in Jerusalem in person to continue and to deepen your engagement with the United States. You can also connect with the U.S. Embassy online on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and on our website for more events and engagement opportunities. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Reach out. Tell me.